If there are any more quizzes, please bring them in. rules apply. I'll let, I'll let you know when the quizzes are done, you can come pick them up. Okay, so by now you know the routine. Okay? So let's let's go back to what we were talking about. I know it's kind of tough to get your mind out of the you know, out of the quiz you know the quiz thinking. But let's start thinking about real options again. We talked about the option to delay in the last class, right? We used it to value two things. One was a, a, you know, valuing a patent, even if it's a non-viable patent. The other is undeveloped reserves for a natural resource company. Today, I want to complete that discussion by bringing in two other options that we tend to ignore in investment analysis and valuation. The first is the option to expand. Okay? Let's talk about the option to expand. I mean, again, let me go back to capital budgeting 101. You have a project, you do the cash flows, you get a net present value. The net present value is negative, you don't take the project. Okay? That's pretty simple. But let's assume you have a project that you know is a bad project, so you're not even looking for glimmers of hope. But you think by taking this project, you will get the potential to enter a new market or come up with a new product. You have the option to expand. And if you think about it in terms of payoff diagrams, this is basically what you're saying. This investment is a bad investment, I know it. But if I take this investment, there is a chance, no guarantee, there's a chance that sometime in the next two years, next three years, next five years, next 10 years, that I might get a chance to do something else, expand into a new market or produce a new product. So what you're going to invest to expand becomes the equivalent of the strike price. What do you think you'll get as the expected cash flows by expanding become the equivalent of the stock price? The life of the option becomes however long you have this decision, decision to expand. But of course, as with any option, you could end up at the end of five years saying, I wish I hadn't done that. In which case, what do you lose? You lose that negative net present value in the first investment. So the option to expand is actually two investments locked together. The first investment is a bad investment. You know that. But the second investment is this potential, potential to expand. This is the option that excites real options people. And let's see how this would play out. You're a consumer product company. You're think, thinking about, should I invest in China or India? Big market, right? And let's say your initial analysis suggests it doesn't make sense. The net present value is negative. You shouldn't do it. But then somebody pipes up saying, but those are such big markets. What do they want, to, what do, they want you to do? Override the analysis. Say, the market is so big, it's OK if the initial net present value is negative. Think about all the great things we could do if things work out. That's the option to expand. This has been around for the longest time. Even before real options became part of the financial vernacular, when you looked at investment analysis, you heard the talk of strategic considerations. It's been around, right? And you know when that will come up? Is when you've done the number crunching, something doesn't work out, a top man will say, but there are strategic considerations. Essentially what he says is, I want to take this project even though the numbers don't look good. So you can see the danger of opening the store, because in a sense, we're overriding everything we talked about as the discipline of corporate finance. But let's, let's, let's look at the potential for this option to expand. And I'm going to take a very simple example from one of my books. In the dark side of valuation, I have a valuation of a software company. Okay. Company called Secure Mail. I did a traditional DC evaluation. So it's all the rules, right? Project the cash flows, you know, estimate the growth, take the present value. I came up with a DCF value of $115 million. Now, that's the intrinsic value of the company. But I'm going to throw in something extra here. This company is an anti produces an antivirus software. They're going to sell it to businesses. And as they sell these, this software, they're collecting a database of businesses that are worried about security. So the database is building up as they're selling this product. 
let's assume that sometime over the next five years, and that's how long they get to make this decision, they've got a fish or cut bait by then, they can decide to introduce a second product based on the database they're building up of all these companies interested in security. So that second product is a database software program. Right now, based on what they know, it'll cost them half a billion dollars to produce this new software. Right now, based on what they know, they think they can make about 40 million a year every year for the next 10 years. Let me stop right there. How much do they have to spend for this new product? A half a billion, right? What do they think they can make? 40 million every year for the next 10 years, even without discounting, whatever I just told you. 40 million times 10 is 400 million. This right now doesn't look like a good deal. But here's what gives it the allure. They know very little about this business, and that 40 million could become 150 million, it could go to 10 million. The standard deviation in that value is 50%. And I'm using publicly traded companies in this space to come up with that standard deviation. So you see what I'm giving you? I'm giving you a value for the project. It's not a good project now, but I'm saying, wait, it's OK, because you don't know much about this business. This project, even though it's a negative net present value project today, could become a positive net present value project in the future. And finally, let me give you a risk-free rate of 3%. So essentially, I've given you a value for the company of $115 million, but I've said there's this chance that they could get a second product. We don't think the product is viable today, but who knows? So let me try to value that second, that option to expand. To value the expansion option, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take what I know today. So I'm not asking you to be clairvoyant. Look into the future. I'm saying, based on what you know today, what's the present value of the cash flows from taking this investment? You're going to make $40 million every year for 10 years. The cost of capital in this business is 12%. The present value of $40 million every year for 10 years at that cost of capital is $226 million. So right now, you think you can make $226 million by taking this project, it's going to co cost you a half a billion. So in terms of pure net present value, that's a minus $274 million net present value, right? But here's the magic of options. You have five years to make this decision. You have a lot of uncertainty. That's a 50% standard deviation and a risk is rate of 3%. This is a project with a negative net present value of minus $274 million. But if I value it as an option, I come up with a value of $56 million. Now do you see why people like real options? Essentially, I'm saying you can take terrible projects and get away with it, because if you're uncertain about the future, if you have a lot of information gaps, you can have a significant option value. So how is this going to play out? Remember, I'm valuing the company at $115 million using a DCF valuation. The value of the option to expand adds another $56 million on top of that $115 million which gives me a total value for the company with the option embedded in it of $171 million. I'll give you a very simple, real example. Let's suppose 10 years ago, you're sitting down to value Apple. I remember it was still a $30 to $40 billion company. It hadn't even, I think, introduced the iPod. It might have been the very first, maybe let's, let's assume that the iPod has just come out. So you sit down to do a valuation of Apple. What was the iPod a competitor to? What was it replacing? It was replacing the Walkman, the, the kind of MP3 players. So if you decided on a potential market for the iPod, that would have been a potential market. It's a big market, but not a huge market. So if you were valuing Apple in 2002, it would have a traditional DC valuation. It would have come up with a value for Apple. Maybe it would have been greater than 40. It definitely would not have been 600 billion. But what did Apple do over the last decade? What did they use the iPod as the base for? It became the base for the iPhone. The iPhone became the base for the, you know, the iPad. In a sense, what they did was that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the option to expand. In some areas, in some businesses, if you succeed, it gives you a launching pad to do other stuff. You're saying, how come you didn't have the foresight to forecast that 10 years ago? Maybe you could have. I didn't see all this coming in 2002. So if I were doing a valuation of Apple, a traditional discounted cash flow valuation would never have captured that optionality. Let's update it. You're valuing Facebook. What's a traditional route? You take the revenues, you take the margins, you get a cash flow, you take the present value. And I have you know, a couple of valuations on my website. But you see the optionality that Facebook has? They have a proprietary base of a billion users. Right now, they haven't figured out how to monetize it yet. 
But in the case of Facebook, again, you can argue that that database, that, that, that competitive advantage they have could have potential here, which goes over and above what you get with a discounted cash flow valuation. That's really the essence of the option to extract. Okay. It adds a premium on to your discounted cash flow valuation. Given that it adds that premium, I'm going to put some, some, some limits on how far you can take it. Okay. You could take any small company and make this argument. right? If it succeeds, there's an option to expand. But here's the catch. For this option to have value, I'm going to go back to that second question asked about all options. Do you have exclusivity? Now, what gave Apple this capacity to take the iPad? I mean, in a sense, everybody saw the iPod succeeding, right? So what prevented the competition from coming in and preempting Apple on the iPhone and the iPad? What, what, what did they control? They control the operating system. Apple's exclusivity comes from the fact that a competitor can't come in and produce. See, the difference between an Apple and a Samsung is Samsung produces a phone that does really well. It's very difficult for, for them to stop a competitor from coming in because they don't own the operating system. What gives Apple this optionality is the exclusivity. That's the test you're going to run when you talk about the option to expand, is, is their exclusivity. Let me go back to that first example I gave you. A few months ago, I read that Marriott was planning to open a bunch of hotels in China. Hey, let's, let's play a game. I don't know the numbers, but let's say you're the Marriott's top management, and I'm do the, doing the number crunching for you. So I project out, and you plan to open 20 hotels. I work through the numbers, and I tell you, you know what? No, the net present value is negative. It doesn't look like you can make money. But you say, okay, that's okay, because there's the option to expect. What are you talking about? If you open these 20 hotels and they do really well, then maybe we'll open 200 more hotels because it's a big country, lots of people around to save those hotel rooms. You're talking about the option to expand. You see the weakness with the Marriott argument? You open the 20 hotels. You're watching them really carefully to see how well they do, right? Because what's your trigger? If they do really well, you plan to open 200 more hotels. What's the weakness in that argument, though? You're watching those hotels. Who else is watching those hotels? Hyatt? Hilton, Holiday Inn. They're all watching the same hotels. And as you do well, what are they planning to do? They're planning to use the information you're collecting by opening those hotels. And just as you get ready to open 200 more hotels, they open those hotels themselves. So if you're a consumer product company opening up markets in China or India, don't give the option to expand to me as an argument for why it's OK to take negative net present value investments unless you offer me some proof that you have exclusivity. So what would, be, what would be that proof? Maybe you got an exclusive license from the Chinese government that allows you and only you to open those hotels. Then we can talk options. But opportunities are not options. A lot of people out there who talk about real options, I think, mix up the two. Just remember that cautionary note. If somebody starts talking about real options, stop and ask that question. Where's the exclusivity? Because if there's no exclusivity, the optionality kind of dissipates. So in some companies, at least, you can make the argument that the optionality will add to the value of the, to the discounted cash. You're willing to pay a premium over the DCF value, but it's going to be few and far between. In fact, talking about social media companies, I argue that Facebook might have some optionality because they have that user base. I think LinkedIn has optionality because they are creating this, this network that is unique to them. Does Groupon have optionality, even in its best days? I don't think so. I mean, where's the option? You send an email out with a deal of the day. What's to stop 100 other people from doing exactly the same thing? And you could have asked that question the day Groupon went public, but nobody did. Now I wake up every morning, and the first thing I check on my emails is there are 10 deals of the day from 10 different companies. If you do not have exclusivity, you cannot talk about optionality. You cannot be paying a premium on top of a discounted cash flow valuation, even if the market you're looking at is potentially a huge market. So let's pass options to expand through the test. Is there an option? Loosely speaking, yes. The contingency you're looking for is if the cash flows, the present value of the cash flows from expanding exceed the cost of expansion to expand. If not, you won't do it. Is there exclusivity? It really varies across different companies. In some companies, there is exclusivity either because you control the technology or you have a significant competitive advantage barrier to entry. In other companies, there is no exclusivity, and there the optionality will kind of disappear. 
And third, if you ask me, you know, can I use an option pricing model? You could, but you're really, again, testing the limits. Neither the underlying asset nor the, nor the option are traded. If they cannot be traded, you cannot replicate, you cannot do arbitrage. So you're kind of pushing the envelope in terms of applying option pricing models in this particular context. So the option to expand is a very exciting one, but it's overused. It's misused. It's always been overused and misused. It's the argument that companies often make for making bad investments in big markets and saying, it's OK. It's a really big market. That's not good enough. You have to show me some exclusivity to the big market to become an option. Okay? Any questions on the option to expand? Let's talk about the option to abandon. This is the only real option we'll talk about, which is a put option. Every other option in real options is a call option. Whether you're talking about patents, whether you're talking about natural resource options, the option to abandon is a put option. Let's very quickly review what you, ha what you get. Let's say you take a project. You make an investment. It's a long-term investment. The option to abandon is the option you get to walk away from a mistake. And you're saying, I'll never make mistakes. Well, then you're alone. Because when you take risks, I don't care how good you are as a decision maker, you will make mistakes. That's what the option to abandon is. Can you walk away from your mistakes? And here's the way I would structure the discussion. If you think about the cost of walking away, because if you walk away from an investment, you might have to pay people, or you might, have, you might get only a fraction of what you invested. That becomes the strike price. You will do it only if the present value of the cash flows from continuing this investment is less than what you would get by abandoning the investment. And if that happens, and you're going to abandon the investment and make the difference, if that never happens, of course, the option to abandon it might cost you money, but basically you lose whatever you pay. Let me give you a very simple example of this. You, you're all probably familiar with Lear Aircraft. It produces these small corporate jets. So let's assume I run Lear Aircraft, and you run Airbus. And I have an idea. I want to produce these mid-sized passenger aircraft. I don't have the capacity to do this on my own. So I come to you and say, would you be interested in a joint venture? I'll put up 50%. You put up 50%. I'll bring in my expertise in building small planes. You bring in your expertise and bring maybe we can create some value. Now, of course, as Airbus, you said, I want to look at the numbers. Okay, so I give you the numbers. And here's what the numbers look like. It'll cost you a half a billion to get a 50% share of this joint venture. And your share of the present value of the cash flows is only 480 million. So already I've told you that if you enter this joint venture, your net present value is going to be minus 20 million. So you say, no, I'm not interested. But I really, really, really want you as my joint venture partner. So I come back to you with a counteroffer. I say, OK. If you become my joint venture partner, I will give you the option to walk away from this investment, abandon this investment, any time over the next five years. And if you do that, I'll give you back 400 million. Not the entire half a billion that you invested, but I'm putting a floor on your losses, right? I'm saying the most you can lose on this is 100 million. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to induce you to invest in this by saying, I'll put a floor on your losses. I'm essentially giving you a put option, right? The put option is any time over the next five years, you can come back to me and say, OK, I'm not interested in this project. I'm bu you know, buy back my 50% share. Let's say that I do a simulation of that 480 million cash flows, and the, and the standard deviation, and the, or I'm sorry, the variance in the present value of the cash flows I get is 0.16. So I do a Monte Carlo simulation. 480 million is my expected value. The variance is 0.16. And the project has a life of 30 years. Why did I, you know, I gave you the option to walk away any time over the next five years, right? Why didn't I give you the option to abandon any time over the next 30 years? If I gave you that option, what are you going to do, even if it's a great project? For 29 years and 364 days, you know, I'm, I like this project, I like this project. The last day of the 30th day, you're going to show up in my office saying, I never liked this project. Can you give me 400 million back? So my advice to you, if you give an option to abandon to, to a joint venture partner, make sure it doesn't run the entire life of the project, because then they're going to get all the good stuff from the project and still demand the option to abandon at the end. So that's why I made it five versus 30 years. So let's value the put option. Here's what it looks like. The value of the underlying asset today. And that's a common theme running across all of these option pricing models. S is based on what you know today. And today, the present value is 480 million. The strike price is what you get from abandonment, 400 million. The variance is 0.16. So you're very uncertain about the 480 million. You have five years on this option. 
But because this is a finite life project, remember each year the value of the project is going to decrease, right? You have 29 years and 28, 27, 26. So each year I'm going to knock off some of the value saying the project is getting less valuable. And the five-year riskless rate is 6%. Five years because the option is a five-year life. If I plug those numbers in, the value that I get for the put option is 73.23 million. And what does this mean? What is the initial net present value that, that, that I gave you on the project? Minus 20, right? Now I'm saying I'll give you an option worth 73.23 million. I'm not saying it's going to guarantee that you'll be my joint venture partner, but I, you can see why you're more tempted to be my JV partner now than before, because effectively, the project has a value of 53.23 million. As Lear Aircraft, you know what I have to be careful about? I gave you this option, right? I can't create value out of nothing. I've given away 73.23 million of my net present value to get you to be my joint venture partner. I have to make sure that my net present value was greater than 73.23 million in the first place. Because if I don't, I could be granting out options that I really cannot afford. You know where this shows up? Is when you send salespeople out. And, and let's say you're, you're, you're Boeing, you send salespeople out to the different airlines. They're selling aircraft. You give them bonuses based on, let's say, how much they sell. So you, the salesperson walks into an airline's office and says, would you be interested in buying 20 aircraft? The airline says, it's too much risk. You know what the salesperson is going to do? He's going to throw in sweetness. If you do this, we, uh, we'll, uh, and he is going to be inclined to offer all kinds of options to abandon. So if things don't work out, we'll take the downside. If things don't work out, we'll buy. But you have to be careful because he gets his bonuses based on what he sells up front. You as the company bear the cost of all those options he's giving away at the time of the sales pitch. It happens time after time. You know, you see this happen even when you walk into an electronic store. The salesperson says, would you buy that 50-inch you know, TV? And when you are a little you know, reluctant, he starts throwing in things. I'll give you this. I'll give you that. And sometimes you've got to wonder whether they're giving this away because they want to collect the commission on the TV or whether it's still a good deal after they've given away all those sweeteners in addition to what you get for your money. So the option to abandon is, is kind of universal. It shows up in lots of different places. Think about what it's costing a company to give up that option to abandon. So here's the bottom line. If you have a long-term project, having an option to abandon that project might make a bad project into a good project. It also means that if you're a small company taking a very long-term expensive investment, in other words, you worry a lot about that investment going bad, it makes sense for you to build in escape hatches. You know what I mean by escape hatches? I mean, companies often, when they make a big long-term investment, want to be so, want to convince the world that they're so sure about this investment and say, look, we're gonna, this is a 30-year project, we'll, we'll stay in here for 30 years. But if you're a small company, if you take a big project that's a long-term project, you want to give yourself the flexibility to get out of that project if things don't work out. You know where this will show up? If you enter into a wage contract with your unions, you might want to enter into a short-term contract, even if it costs you more than a long-term contract. With suppliers, even though a 20-year deal might be cheaper than a two-year deal, you might settle for a two-year deal. There is an advantage to preserving flexibility if you're taking long-term investments. And that's basically what we're talking about in the context of the option to abandon. So you've got the option to delay, the option to expand, the option to abandon. Let's face it, life is full of options, right? I mean, this is not just for business. I mean, we're, you, know, I mean you look at taking a job. Or more, more important, getting married is uh, you've just you've given up your option to delay. Right? Hey. People use that option. I mean, I know, we know people who've been engaged 21 years, 15 years. The Somebody's exercising, using their option to delay one side rather than the other. And of course, that option to delay is gone. Of course, you get married. Divorce is the option to abandon. Having affairs is the option to expand. In a sense, you can think about this as essentially, you know, all in, in, everything we do in life is about either exercising options or holding on to options. I mean, your job offers, right? Some, some jobs come with more options in the future than others. So it's, we're not just talking about financial stuff. This is part of life. And we have to start thinking about these options when we make decisions. It's not just about what we know right now and what gives us the biggest financial payoff now. It's preserving these options can add to that value. Next piece 
of options is options. And most of the options we talk about in the context of capital structure show up in the securities. Convertible bonds have an option embedded in them. Okay? Warrants are options. So a lot of what we talk about in the context of options and capital structure relate to securities. But you're going to see that in a fixed income class or an options class. So I'm not interested in those. I'm actually going to focus in on one aspect of the capital structure decision where I think option pricing kind of helps out. You know, whether you remember, in corporate, when we did corporate finance, we talked about the optimal debt ratio for a company, right? So did somebody remind me what the optimal debt ratio for a company is? What, what's the criterion that determines what the optimal debt ratio for a company is? What do we look for? Minimize cost to cap. Right? If you remember the schedule we drew up for Disney, we started with no debt, 10% debt, 20% debt. And if you didn't take corporate finance from me, I'm sure you saw a variant of that in your classes. We look to see what debt ratio minimized the cost of capital. And we said that's the optimal debt ratio for the company, because that's where the cost of capital is minimized. The very last class in corporate finance, I showed you what you found as your optimal debt ratio for your company versus the actual debt ratio. And if you don't remember, and I don't blame you for not remembering, 80% of the companies analyzed last semester in the corporate finance class. 80% of the companies had less than optimal debt. They were under level. And that's not unusual. In fact, you take all companies globally, 8 out of 10 companies have too little debt relative to that optimal. And here's one of the most frustrating things. If you do a lot of optimal, let's say you work in corporate finance and you advise companies on capital structure. When you go to a company and say, your optimal debt ratio is 40%, they're at 10%, you expect them to jump up and say, thank you, I'll go to 40%. But many companies will contest you when you say your optimal is 40%. In fact, here's the, here are the two words that used to drive me crazy when I first started talking about capital structure to companies. You go to a company, say your optimal is 40%, you're at 10%, you should borrow more money. And they say, no, we don't want to. So how come? We want to preserve our financial flexibility. Sounds good, right? Who can argue against financial flexibility? Sounds like a good thing. And for the first couple of years when I heard those words, I would kind of stop because I didn't know what to say next. Then I started asking the question, what are they talking about? What is this financial flexibility? So let me throw that question to you. You have a company that's all, that has an optimal of 40%. That's where the cost of capital is minimized. They're at 10%, which means they're at a higher cost of capital than they need to be. What exactly do they mean by financial flexibility? What does that what does being under leveled give them that, that keeps them under leveled? What, what are they hoping to do with that excess debt capacity? Yeah. And why are you taking on the debt, too? OK. You might need it for an investment. It, you might need it to tide over a bad, you know, a recession, something happening to the company. In other words, you're holding back debt capacity because you feel you could use it to cover a gap in your financing. You know why in traditional corporate finance that argument would never have worked? Traditional corporate finance, we assume that capital markets are always open and accessible, right? So if you were in a pure world of traditional corporate finance, my counter to use, you don't need that excess debt capacity because you can always issue more equity and debt if you need the money. You know why that argument breaks down, though? For this to work, you have to be willing to issue new equity. And most companies hate issuing new equity, especially if they're publicly traded companies. Why is that? What does issuing new equity mean? You issue new shares to the market, right? The minute, minute you issue new shares, the bogeyman comes out of the closet. What am I talking about? What, what do companies start to talk about when they issue new? Dilution. U.S. companies in particular, especially the publicly traded companies, hate to issue new equity. If you don't believe me, go back and take a look at how much finan new financing each year comes from new debt and how much comes from new equity. It doesn't mean that they don't use equity. But the primary way that companies raise equity for projects is from retained earnings. So many companies operate with this internal constraint, which is we don't want to issue new shares, and we might have to take a great project. Now you can see why that becomes the basis for a financial flexibility argument. They're actually talking about an option to take a project. In fact, if I were to draw this as a payoff diagram, and it's going to be a little abstract, so kind of hang in there, here's the option you're talking about in the context of financial flexibility. Let's assume that there's a certain amount of financing each year that you can cover. 
from your normal needs. Normal needs would be whatever you get from retained earnings, whatever debt you normally issue during the course of a year. Maybe it's, you know you might cover working capital with debt, but that's basically the the amount that you would raise from your norm without drawing on flexibility. What you want the excess debt capacity for is if your actual reinvestment needs, for whatever reason, a new acquisition, a big project, a downturn in the economy, if your actual reinvestment needs exceed that expected need, you want to use the debt capacity to cover that difference. That's the option you're getting, is by holding back below your optimal, you're saying, hey, I can draw on that excess debt capacity to cover the difference. And if I cover the difference, then I'm going to be able to take all these projects I otherwise would not have been able to take. Now, is it possible that you stay at 10% that acquisition that you were hoping for never shows up? Sure. In which case, what have you lost? What is the cost of being at 10% when your optimal is 40%? Why do we say the 40% is your optimal? Because your cost of capital is lower, right? By staying at 10%, you have a much higher cost of capital. So the cost you bear by being under levered is that difference in the cost of capital. The benefit you get is this optionality that you get by using that excess debt capacity for that great project that might or might not come along. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take Disney from way back in time. This was from an optimal debt ratio that I did for Disney in 1998, in the first edition of my book. I could do this with the, with the more recent one, too. But let me go back in time. The optimal debt ratio I arrived at for Disney was, 11, was 40%. And the cost of capital I had at the optimal was 11.64%. So you can see that I chose the optimal as the point at which my cost of capital was minimized. So this is Corporate Finance 101. Their actual debt ratio was 18%, at which point their cost of capital was 12.22%. So you're Disney. You're stuck at 18% with a 12.22% cost of capital. And I'm claiming that if you go to 40%, your cost of capital would drop to 11.64%. So right now, what's the price you're paying by being under 11? It's a difference between those two numbers, right? You're paying 58 basis points a year. That's how much higher your cost of capital is by being at 18% rather than 40%. Now, if you lived in a world without constraints, where you can raise as much capital as you want, then I'm going to put pressure on you to go to 40% right away, saying, hey, you don't need to hold back on excess debt capacity. But let's say you, as Disney, make the argument that you need this excess debt capacity as an option. I'm going to try to price that option on an annual basis. And here's what, here are the numbers that I'm going to use. For my S, which is what my reinvestment needs are, I look at your capex and working capital over time as a percentage of firm value. And if I average that over the last five years, that's 5.3%. So I'm taking net capex and change in working capital each year, dividing by the market value of the firm. So over the last five years, Disney on average has reinvested 5.3% of its firm value back into the business. Then I computed how much internal external cap. So basically, I looked at the retained earnings. I assumed they would not issue new equity because they, they, they haven't. And on top of that, I added the normal amount of debt that they have access to, which is usually short-term debt. And that amount worked out to about 4.8% a year as a percent of firm value every year for the last five years. So on average, they've reinvested 5.3% a year. And the amount that they feel comfortable raising internally is about 4.8% a year. This 5.3% reinvestment has a lot of variance. Why? Because they did one big acquisition over that five-year period, which pushed up the reinvestment rate. That reinvestment rate, that variance worked out to 0.375. So the 5.3% is my expected reinvestment, but it could be 12 if I do a big acquisition. It could be 2 if I don't do any. 4.8% is what I feel comfortable raising each year for my internal financing. So I set it up as an option, and I valued the option. The value that I got for the option by, with those inputs is 1.6092% based on that SK and sigma from the previous page. So what am I valuing? I'm valuing the option for Disney to take a new project. right? But what's the value of the new project? The net present value I get from that project, what I earn over and above the cost of capital. And in this case, here's the final piece of the puzzle. At the time that I looked at Disney in 98, they were earning an excess return of 6.47% over and above their cost of capital. Remember, the cost of capital is 12.22%. They were earning 18.69%. I'm going to assume that a new project, if it comes along, will continue to earn that same excess return. That's key to valuing this option. Because the option to take zero net present value projects is worth nothing. The option to take negative net present value projects is even worse. It's only if you have good projects that I'm going to give you license to hold back excess debt, debt capacity. Intuitively, I'm saying, if you're in a neutral 
neutral business, you're not making more than your cost of capital, why hold back on debt capacity? What are you going to do? Take another zero net present value project? So it's only those excess returns that create value. And that's basically what I'm doing here. I'm taking the 1.6092%, which is the value of the option. I'm taking the excess return that I'm making on the project. And I'm assuming that past projects are a good indicator of the future. And assume you can make those excess returns in perpetuity. So that's the present value of a perpetuity. What I get as my annual value for this option to take projects is 0.85%. So now I can bring in both sides of the puzzle. Disney is under level. It has too little debt. Right now, it's paying 58 basis points every year by having too little debt. That's the difference between their optimal cost of capital and their actual cost of capital. But by being under levered, they actually gain 0.85% in value because of that value financing flexibility. You know what the bottom line here is? Even though Disney is under levered, because they gain more by being under levered than they're losing, when they say, look, we value financial flexibility, we don't want to borrow more, I'm going to say, OK, you're right. I'm essentially giving you a tool to complete the capital structure analysis. Because many of you, at the end of your optimal debt ratio analysis for your company, said, hey, why is my company under levered? How come they're not at the optimum? I'm playing devil's advocate and telling you the argument they will make. And I'm giving you a way for you to quantify that argument and say, hey, does that make sense or doesn't it? Because if you look at what's driving the value of flexibility here, here are the three things that drive it. The first is, capital constraints. If you have no capital constraints, there's no value to flexibility. If you can raise as much capital as you want and you don't constrain yourself, then you don't need financial flexibility. And those constraints can either come from internal constraints because you don't want to issue stock, or it can be external. Other things remain equal. A small company should value flexibility more than a large company. An emerging market company should value flexibility more than a developed market company. I would expect emerging market companies to be far more under level than developed market companies. Do you see why? Because capital markets can shut down. You're much more worried about capital constraints. You're going to borrow way less than a, than a developed market company. In fact, they might push their debt ratio to 0% and keep going. How can you have a debt ratio less than 0%? What am I talking about? If you really, really, really value financial flexibility and you're worried about capital markets in your country shutting down, in addition to not borrowing money, what are you going to do to kind of cover? You're going to accumulate cash. Your net debt ratio can be negative. So I would hypothesize that if you go into markets where capital markets are, or countries where capital markets are completely undependable and they can shut down, you should expect to see not just that companies don't borrow money, but that they accumulate a significant amount of cash in those countries. And as those constraints weaken, you should start to see more borrowing. In Latin America, for instance, you've had these, these, these two, I mean, if you look at countries, not every country has moved in the right direction okay, in terms of opening up markets. But some countries, like Brazil, have, had, have, have seen their markets become much more open. I would hypothesize that you'd expect to see debt ratios in Brazil climb much faster than debt ratios in Venezuela. So capital constraints are the first factor that drives how much the value of flexibility is. Second, remember that standard deviation on my reinvestment? The higher that number, the more valuable the option becomes. Financial flexibility is more valuable if you are in an unpredictable business than if you're in a predictable business. So if you're in technology, I would expect you to borrow a lot less money than if you're in steel. And that's exactly what you see, right? Many of you looked at technology companies, noticed they were far more underlevered than companies in mature businesses. And if you're a company that grows through acquisitions, I would expect you to value financial flexibility more and borrow less than a company that doesn't, because that adds to my variance. And finally, all of this has value only if you're in a business where you can earn more than your cost of capital. If you're in the airline business or the automobile business, please don't talk to me about financial flexibility. To do what? Take another zero net present value project? So if you're in a business ma where making excess returns is possible, then we can talk about financial flexibility. So I know your value. I mean, each of you is valuing a company. Take, think about your company and say, my company doesn't make sense to be under level. And in some companies, the answer is absolutely. We're far too quick to jump on companies and say, you're under level. You should borrow more money. Give, th give the argument about financial flexibility at least a chance to be made. And look at it. Some cases, you might say, that makes sense. Some cases, you might say, it doesn't make sense. 
But that's the core of the financial flexibility argument. Which brings me to the final example of option pricing. Okay. When you think about value, buying equity in a publicly traded company, there are two key characteristics that equity ha has. One is it gives you a residual claim. You know, what I mean by a residual claim is you get whatever's left over after every other claim has been met. By definition, equity investors are the last players in the game. The second is if you have equity in a publicly traded company, it comes with limited liability. What does that mean? You c your stock price can go to zero. But that's it. You say, well, how much worse can it get? Wouldn't it be terrible if your broker called you and said, you know what, your stock is now $5 below zero. Please send in $5. That cannot happen with a public company, but it can happen with a private business. Because if you have unlimited liability, what happens is not only can your business become worthless, and, but your, your, your banker can come to you and say, I'm going to say, no, give me your house. Give me the rest of your so." With public companies, you get limited liability and you get a residual claim. You're saying, so what? Here's what I'd like you to think about. Okay? You, as the equity investors in a publicly traded company, can liquidate the company anytime you want. It's, an, it, it's within your rights. And if you liquidate the company, let's assume that what you get in liquidation is whatever the value of the assets is. Right after you liquidate the firm and you get those cash flows, though, what's the first thing you need to do? Before you start touching those cash flows, you've got to pay off the existing debt, right? So let's say the face value of the debt is equivalent to the strike price. So if you liquidate the firm and the value of the assets exceeds the face value, you get to keep the difference. If you liquidate the firm and the value of the assets is less than the face value of the debt, then you basically say limited liability. What you lose is what you originally paid for the stock. Equity in a publicly traded company can take on the characteristics of an option. In fact, it does for every company. If you have a healthy company, the option to liquidate the company is going to be worth a lot less than the value that you get as a going concern. But if you buy stock in a distressed company, and I'm going to be very specific about what I mean by distress, the company that's losing money and has a lot of debt, you're essentially buying an option. You're not buying a stock. Let me explain what I mean by that. Normally, you buy stock for the cash flows, right? The essence of the discounted cash flow model is that when you buy a stock, you value it based on the expected cash flows. The dividend discount model, the cash flows are expected dividends. In a free cash flow of the firm model, they're free cash flows equity, or free cash flows of the firm. When you buy stock in a healthy company, that's why you're buying the stock, because you want to get cash flows back. But when you buy stock in a distressed company, please don't buy it for the dividends. You're not going to get any. And the only cash flows you're probably going to see are going to be big negative cash flows. You're not buying the stock for the same reasons that you buy stock in a healthy company. So that's the framework I'm going to use to at least set up this process. And I'll start with a very simple example. Let's assume you have a firm. You value the assets. The assets right now have a value of 100 million. So you do a discounted cash flow valuation, a liquidation valuation, whatever. But right now, the value of the assets is 100 million. But that can change. It can change because you're in a risky business. So let's assume the standard deviation in that value is 40%. So the 100 million could go up to 130. It could go down to 70. So there's variance around the value. Let's also assume that this company has one zero coupon bond outstanding. And in a minute, I'm going to ask you why I have to be so specific about the type of debt. One zero coupon bond outstanding with a face value of 80 million and 10 years left to maturity. So you have $100 million in assets, and the face value of the debt is, is $80 million. It's a one-zero coupon bond. I'll let you play the, the fund role. You're going to be the equity investors in this company. I'm going to be the banker. So I've lent you the money on a zero coupon bond, $80 million, due in 10 years. You are the equity investors. You run the company. So the first question I have for you is, given the information I have here, and I'll give you the risk-free rate of 10%, can you tell me what the equity in this company is worth and what interest rate I should charge on the debt? Doesn't look like they've given you enough information, right? I haven't told you anything about cash flows. I've given you a cost of capital. I haven't told you what the rating is. But I'm going to argue that with the limited information you have, you actually can answer those questions. And here's how. What do you own? You own equity, right? Equity has a characteristic of a call option. You get the option to liquidate. Let's value that option to liquidate. If you liquidated the firm today, what would you get? You get 100 million, right? The minute you liquidate the firm, though, you've got to pay the 80 million debt because that becomes the strike price on the option. How many years do you get to play this game? 10 years before 
Now do you see why I had to make it a zero coupon bond? Because by making it a zero coupon bond, I have no claims on the company for the next nine years and 364 days. You can play whatever game you want. I can't stop you. If this had been a normal coupon bond, the power would have shifted to me every six months. In what, what sense? Every six months, you'd have to make an interest expense. And if you couldn't make it, I take over the firm. By making it a zero coupon bond, I've given you unfettered freedom to run this company for the next nine years and 364 days. That becomes the life of the option. The variance in the value of 100 million is 0.16. The risk plus rate is 10%. I have everything I need for an option pricing model, right? I plugged into the Black Scholes, D1, D2, N of D1. N of, let me start. What, what is N, N of D2 measure again? The likelihood that S will be greater than K. But what's S here? It's the value of the assets. K is the face value of the debt. There's a 63% chance that the value of the assets will be greater than the face value of the debt, which means there's a 37% chance of what? That the value of the assets will be less, which is our definition of bankruptcy, right? There's a 37% chance of bankruptcy. It's 1 minus ND2. It's a very different way of thinking about bankruptcy risk. In fact, there's an outfit on the West Coast called KMB, okay? founded about 30 years ago by three, re not three academics. And actually, it's, a, it's an outfit that does one thing and one thing very well. If you're a bank, you can take a loan portfolio to KMB, and they'll give you the probability of default on that portfolio. You take a bunch of securities, they'll give you a probability of default on those securities. And it's a black box. So all you see is they give you the number, and they say, trust us. We know what we're doing. You know what they do? They essentially run the option pricing model. They, of course, have finessed it and made it much more complicated. They get D N of D2. They take 1 minus N of D2. So basically, they compute the probability of default the same way that we compute the probability of default here. So let me complete the story, though. If I plug the numbers in, the value that I get for the equity in this company is 75.94 million. That's the value of your equity. The value of the firm is 100 million, so the value of my debt is whatever's left over, which is 24.06 million. Remember, it's a zero coupon bond. So I know the face value is 80 million. I know the market value is 24.06. I can back out the interest rate from that loan and come up with 12.77%, which gives me a default spread of 2.77% above the risk-free rate. I actually saw a working paper a few years ago that actually tried to predict the default spreads on bonds using this approach and tested it in using ratings to get default spreads. And it actually found that the option pricing approach gave you better predictions of what the default spreads on bonds were than using a triple B, a double B, whatever the ratings approach was. So it's a different way of thinking about equity in a company. So next session when we start off, we're going to use this example to kind of examine the underlying dynamics of what drives equity values.